Namaste and good evening. I am Mahima Kapoor, researcher and assistant editor at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabha Evam Media Nusandan Sanstan, Nai Delhi. Welcome you all to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of timely data collection and sharing and the usage of data for decision making. To understand how data informs vigilant response and supports preparedness towards pandemics, we have gathered for a panel discussion under the series, The State of Population and Development, hashtag population and development, on population data and pandemic preparedness. This deliberation is being organized by the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development. I feel honored to introduce the moderator, Mr. Devinder Singh. Sa is a Global Studies Program Fellow, University of Freiburg, Germany, and Visiting Senior Fellow at IMPRI. Welcome, sir. I feel privileged to introduce the eminent panel for today. Dr. Venkatesh Srinivasan is a public health and development professional and previously with the United Nations Population Fund. Welcome, sir. Ms. Urvashi Prasad is the Director, Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office, Niti Aayog. Welcome, ma'am. Professor Mala Ramanathan is a professor, Ajuta Menon Center for Health Science Studies, Shichitra Trunu Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology, Trivandrumparam, and working editor, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. Welcome, ma'am. And Dr. Kunar Keshri is an assistant professor, G.B. Panth Social Science Institute, Prayagraj. Welcome, sir. Now I invite Mr. Singh to take the proceedings further, and we look forward to learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahima. Uh, first of all, let me once again welcome the distinguished panelists. And also uh, to share that I'm very excited because this theme has been very close to our heart uh, from the time when we were working, uh, both Venkatesar and I were working, uh, we were working with the UNFPA. Uh, because at that time, COVID-19 started and we were working very closely with the government, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, as well as uh, Niti Ayo. Uh, uh, WHO was uh, uh, mainly involved with the epidemic data and tracking the epidemic. But what we were seeing that there was paucity of data. Most of the agencies, experts, they were saying that we need to have better data. Data group uh, at the UN, they were working together to create a framework to collect data from different sources and to track the epi epidemic. Later on, not only UN agencies, but every agencies and not only in India, uh, in other countries also found that data availability and data uses in uh, predicting the uh, behavior of the epidemic, as well as uh, uh, countering or mounting a uh, effective response to the epidemic. The need of data, timely data, usable data, uh, uh, <coughs> cross-comparative uh, data, that, that need was felt. <coughs> we at UNFPA, because we work with the, uh, we used to work with the population uh, uh, data, then we also thought of that apart from the regular data, health management information system data, could there be other data also which could be used uh, to predict uh, the epidemic or its trajectory? And from there, the need for this kind of discussion started at that time. And I'm happy that uh, uh, IMPRI has taken the initiative to organize this uh, job. 
uh, uh, which we are calling panel discussion, but as I wrote in my email, it will be more of uh, 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 presentation and discussion. So we will be hearing from the expert panelists uh, uh, on different themes covering uh, different areas within, within, within the, this theme of uh, uh, how to use population data or how to uh, find population data uh, to prepare for the, uh, for the pandemic. I also want to share that this team we have taken, this is the first session which we are organizing and we plan to organize many sessions uh, under the overall broad uh, thematic unit uh, within the IMPRI that is population and development. Uh, because we, we think that somehow when we talk of population, we talk of uh, demographics, and demographic data in isolation uh, of the of the its its linkages consequences with the development and when development experts they are meeting they they don't know what kind of impact or uh, uh, effect demographic factors have on uh, development also academicians they work within their institutions and organizations uh, policy makers they work with different mindset within the government and think tanks, we also thought if we can bring them together where academic insights are shared in a language which could be uh, easily accessible to the policy makers and policy makers also can tell the uh, academicians and experts what they are looking for, what, what are they, they missing when, when they, they think of uh, formulating a policy or a program so we are thinking of creating a platform also, or a, what we say, a group of practitioners where the two can come together and also uh, the young researchers so that they can learn how to combine the two. And then take different themes within the population develop, development interlinkages and organize similar kind of sessions. So that is the overall aim and how we can disseminate them, how, can, how we can uh, reach to a wider audience uh, uh, that uh, IMPRI uh, is thinking of through uh, reports, through maybe a compendium later on when we have organized a certain number of sessions and also through the uh, like Facebook Live is there, video, videos will be formed, small videos, uh, so that we can reach to the wider, wider audience, not only the people who uh, Zoom in, uh, for, for a particular session. Uh, so not taking much time at, at the beginning, uh, um, and I think all the uh, who have joined in are more eager to ex uh, hear the experts. So uh, not delaying further, I invite Professor Ramanathan uh, uh, to start with her presentation. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Singh, and uh, at the beginning, I should say that I'm really not an expert. I'm uh, more of a data user. And uh, many of the things I'm talking about comes from scouring all over to see how best in helping others as a demographer on how best they can use the existing sources to track anything, you know, including the pandemic. And so what I'm going to speak comes from struggling over the past two years to educate colleagues, you know, epidemiologists and other people working in public policy about the advantages and disadvantages of existing population data sources in the country. So, you know, it's not so much of expert as much as a data user that I speak. So it's very important for me to add this disclaimer that these presentation, uh, the opinions expressed are my own and do not represent those of the institutions to which I'm af affiliated. I'm also grateful <coughs> to Dr. Uday Shankar Mishra, Professor IAPS Mumbai for a useful discussion on this topic, which helped me to collate this presentation. 
So what are the existing data sources for planning and monitoring vital rates? And many of you must have seen this discourse, the census, the delayed census, et cetera. India's backbone of planning is the decadal census that has been conducted synchronously since 1881 across the country. It was due in 2021 and was interrupted due to pandemic conditions. It is very, very important to recognize why the census has primacy. There are two reasons. One is almost the whole country gets counted. It gives us for every estimate we make the denominators. There is no rate without a denominator. And therefore the census is the backbone of all our planning, especially in the area of health and development. And this reporting to the census and its restriction from use in any other forum it's a legal requirement for a citizen of the country to report to the census according to the Census of India Act of 1948, Section 8.2. The other one which we have for monitoring deaths and other vital events, it doesn't give you morbidity, but definitely death and cause of death is the civil registration system. For some reason, this is the least spoken about mechanism of uh, monitoring a pandemic in the country and that is also bound by the legal requirements of registration of births and deaths in the country we have legally required to report it within 21 days the next one which is a sample registration system actually provides reliable estimates for births and death rates for rural and urban areas across the country for states the other important source is the National Statistical Office, in which is the old National Sample Survey Organization's various surveys on economy, consumption, infrastructure, health, education, migration, and a whole gamut of topics. There are other resources that have gained currency and incredible credibility, like the National Family Health Survey, of which five waves are available. The earlier demographic and health surveys, demographic health surveys which were three waves were available earlier, which is now co-terminus with NFHS. The IHDS for development, one wave is over, the second wave is two waves actually, I'm sorry. And the longitudinal aging survey of India, that is another wave one, and the global adult, adult tobacco survey of which two waves are over. There is a plethora of data sources, many of them in the public domain that are actually available. But, you know, having said that, each one comes with limitations. I have said that it is necessary to report births and deaths, the civil registration system under the law. It can provide data on the deaths. However, it's reporting how many of us each one of us can actually think of the people in our families, in our extended circles where a death occurred for which a death certificate is not available. It's very common practice in most parts of India that unless there is some inheritance or a legal requirement, we don't, for birth certificates in today's world, yes, by and large, within a period of three years before entering school, there is a higher chance of registering a birth, but a lower chance of registering a death. And therefore, you need to realize that registration, I'm, I'm giving you only deaths. It is improving in the civil registration system, but it's not uniform. Across India, in 2011, it was 66.4. And in 2019, it had improved, significantly improved, and this is the most recent available in civil registration. 2019, we have 92% registration. But you look at the variation across the country. Kerala has 100% registration of deaths. Whereas Bihar, even in 2019, had registered only about half of the expected deaths. So, you know, the, while the civil registration system does record deaths and some of those deaths we have the cause of death 
it is not a complete presentation of all the deaths and therein lies its limitation. Why people, there are two reasons. One is very few people know about its existence and its utility. And the second part is its serious limitation because of the incompleteness, ununiform incom uh, completeness across states. So the civil registration system does report the level of registration. That is the extent to which deaths are reported for counting against the actual number of deaths. And again, it's not, you know, like somebody counted the deaths. They come up with an estimate of the number of deaths that are supposed to occur. This is based on the sample registration system, which is another source I mentioned. And it is structured to provide accurate estimates of births and deaths by age for states and union territories. The sample registration system is independent of the CRS and therefore, you know, it is a useful tool for triangulation. We can use it by adjusting the number of reported deaths against the actual number of expected deaths. We can actually project deaths and the uh, um, expected number of deaths with some modicum of accuracy. So yes, we can use the civil registration system to monitor the deaths, but can we monitor the deaths by cause of death? Counting the dead and counting the dead by why they died is what is a serious problem. The cause of death in Indian statistical system produces data on causes of death by the states using SRS data. The most recent published version is 2007-13. This is based on SRS and it is not validated through any external means. For recent years, there is an alternative source that has been computing the cause of death statistics, but what we have publicly available is only the published record of 2007-13. So that brings us back to the alternative, the CRS. Medically certified deaths? Yes, medically certified deaths are taken, extracted from the CRS. The most recent report available is 2019. Cause of death reported with the medical certificate available through a panel of you know, hospitals which are pre-fixed to report. And this gives us medically certified deaths. But look at the proportion of medically certified deaths to even total registered deaths. In Bihar, it is all over India, it is 20.7 at the current moment, the most recent one. In Bihar, it is 5.11. Even in a state like Kerala, the proportion of medically certified deaths to total registered deaths is 11.6. But Kerala, in a sense, is better because all deaths are registered. So the sample registration system, which I've been talking about, which gives us cause of death statistics. Now, why is it that people haven't demanded that the SRS give us, you know, a means of monitoring the pandemic deaths? The SRS, yes, can be asked to provide the data. But the SRS in 2021, you look at it, the sample registration system sets up a panel every 10 years for and fixes that panel for rural and urban sampling units for estimates of births and deaths over the next 10 years. In using the census of India 2011, in 2014, this panel was set up. We do not have the census 2021. So until the census is over, updating this panel is fraught with problems. So what happens if the population which you're going to use is fixed and you continue to use the same sampling units to make estimates. See, there is a natural cohort attrition. That means the people who have to have births have had births. People who are likely to die are dying. And so your population, while the births are more in India than deaths, there is a natural process of attrition in that cohort from the time it is set up that continues to occur over the years. And we are very close to reaching the mark when it has to be changed. Therefore, 
look at the confidence intervals that come from sample registration system for the death rates. Very narrow for All India. Wonderful. So we can rely on, you know, the sample registration system's death rates. Even though we don't have information, we can ask for cause of death as the people report it. We, we can use it. But look at the confidence, confidence intervals. Very, very narrow. You know, uniformly about 1.1 or 0.2. So reasonably reliable. But are the death rates uniformly reliable across states? Just look at the 95% confidence interval when rural and urban rates vary and I'm giving you only the total. Death rate for total 6.4, it ranges, ranges 0.6 here. Bihar, the range is again 0.5. Why is it more narrow for Bihar? Why? Because Bihar is a large state where fertility and mortality have remained more or less declined very slowly. Therefore, your confidence intervals will also be equally narrow. You take the states where declines are likely to be faster. For example, Kerala, 7.1 is the death rate. But look at the confidence interval, 6.7 to 7.6. It is very, very wide when compared to Bihar. Look at Odisha. 7.1, but 6.8 and 7.5. Uttar Pradesh, the overall death rate is 6.5, but look at the narrowness of it. So the reliability of that rate that you get up in the SRS itself is not uniform across states. So how can we verify the validity of any data source? By checking for accuracy internally, that is consistently done across all data sources. Triangulation through external means using the SRS to validate the CRS. That is something we can do and we should do on an ongoing basis. We need to, you know, talk more about these things on an ongoing basis through to epidemiologists and others. This SRS gets compromised because as the SRS moves be closer to the census years, the confidence intervals are going to widen for the states where mortality declines have happened. So we need to take cognizance of that. So even though the overall rate is valid, it is not uniform across the states. What other sources have helped in the context of the pandemic? Whatever data, what's and all, we have to make use of them. People have tried, some have succeeded, some have failed, all of it in parts. The Indian statistical systems have in the past come up with wonderful mechanisms to provide indirect estimates for many necessary vital events, even when data and that talent exists within the country, a country which produced people like Mahalo Nobis set up the Indian Statistical Institute, is a country with phenomenal but hidden talent. The Office of the Registrar General of India in the past routinely produces indirect estimates. We need to strengthen that skill to look for indirect ways and means of measurement. We need to build on that. We can use the CRS, come up with better estimates. So what do we need to do? We have to for sure, make sure our census, that is the backbone of Indian planning, gets conducted. We have to strengthen the CRS because it is an individual need. People need to register birth and deaths. It's also a civic duty because it gives us accurate weight. So we need to strengthen the CRS, create mechanism of monitoring these deaths and causes accurately in a decentralized manner which is without blaming individuals in positions of power or systems. Only when we make autonomous our data collection mechanisms without politicizing them, will we have accurate data. We have to strengthen the statistical systems within the ORGI's offices because they have the data, they know its limitations and they know its strengths. It, and elsewhere and use all these resources to provide vital rates, including pandemic planning. We need to identify and mutual those skills, you know, which gave us indirect estimates for almost anything to, you know, re 
create that magic to give us estimates which exist within academia and elsewhere as part of a larger scheme of planning for pandemics and preparedness for anything within the country. I, I know that the skill exists, but it is rendered invisible because of serious misgivings and many other factors. We need to find and mutual those skills as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramanathan. Uh, <clears throat> very, you said you are not experts, just a data user, but uh, <clears throat> we can see the, your expertise and the, uh, how you have touched different uh, data sets and the lacunas are uh, shortcomings they have and what, what, what needs to be done. Uh, what we will do, we will uh, take the questions and uh, uh, discussion later on once we have all the presentation. So now we will move to the uh, next presentation by uh, Kunal Keshri, and he will be talking about the migration and migrant uh, question, which was, you can say, that was the defining feature of the first wave. Uh, so uh, let's go to Kunal uh, for, for presentation. Are you ready? Am I audible? Yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, let me share my screen. So, is it visible? <coughs> yes. Fine. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, IMPRI uh, directors, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, moderator, Dr. Devender Singh, for inviting me to this prestigious lecture series. And uh, I would like to say uh, hello and welcome to our panelists, all the senior members. Professor Mala Rangnathan, Mala ma'am, hello. Uh, Dr. Srinivasan, uh, Dr. Urvasi Prasad, Director, Niti Hayo. Uh, I would like to start my presentation from a brief note that migrants are a very important part of our society, our population, and they must be uh, given um, their due uh, consideration, their due respect, and they're <clears throat> not only in cities, but in whole country. So, uh, according to the theme given to me, I am I will be talking on population data and focusing on the internal migration. So, briefly, I can uh, say that uh, pandemic. The word pandemic has come from Greek uh, adjective, and its meaning is to incident to a whole people. So, epidemic becomes pandemic. Uh, not only due to the number of people, but time and space it takes. What is the geographical coverage? It's very important to declare uh, any endemic, uh, pandemic, epidemic or disease to pandemic. And COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic by World Health Organization in March, 2020, when it spread globally within three months of its first appearance at Wuhan, China. And then it spread like a wildfire. Uh, if we talk about the recorded history, so few of the notorious pandemics were the first uh, plague. Uh, it came around 540 to 550 uh, common era. It was also known as bubonic plague. And it, it really devastated the Byzantine Empire, which was mostly known as the Eastern Roman Empire. The second plague came in 1346 to, and it was till 1353, uh, and it was known as a Black Death. It ravaged Europe like anything, and it was also known as, due to its uh, number of people died, rough estimate says that millions of people died, that as a great mortality. And if we talk about the recent evidences of pandemic, which are known, uh, more well-documented, and Chinmay Tumbe has written a book on this, so I'm quoting him. So during 1817 to 1920, cholera killed around 20 million people worldwide. In the same period, plague claimed almost 13 million lives. 
and the deadliest pandemic. Why it is called deadliest? Because you can see the number of people killed, 20 million in a short period of 1918 to 1920. And its repetition is uh, maybe, we can say in terms of the current uh, COVID-19. So a pandemic affects millions of people and sometimes ravages civilization. So preparedness is of utmost importance. COVID-19, which is having a devastating impact on the humankind for more than two years is yet to be controlled. And till that means recent estimate of WHO show that uh, we have 304 million confirmed cases worldwide and around 5.4 million deaths have occurred till that. And India is one of the lar second largest country in the world. It has also almost uh, uh, 36 million people have means, been confirmed as a COVID patient, maybe once, seconds, or three times. And around half million deaths have occurred till death, roughly. Yeah, and people, experts say, epidemiologists say that peak of the third wave is yet to come. So what comes in future, it's a very dangerous it may be very dangerous if we are not uh, taking care of this. So now um, to know, uh, to enhance understanding of a situation like pandemic, we need to have a data as Professor Mala Rangnathan has have told that uh, we need a data, population data in different aspects, whether mortality or fertility, whether in, so uh, different dimension like age, sex, geographic area, geographic coverage, education, ethnicity, or any population subgroup. So COVID-19 has affected older adults. So they, they have been given more priority in vaccination and all the hospitalization. So similarly, a group of population migrants, which have been directly or indirectly affected by COVID-19 globally, whether due to the uh, loss of jobs in Gulf areas or to a, a lockdown of the Western countries like European countries. So different kinds of not only by the only uh, contagions or why infections these have been affected, but side effects of these are very important to learn and understand. So along with the overall number of migrants, we always are, how many migrants are there? So it is important, but the composition or heterogeneity of migrants is equally important to be considered when we talk about the preparedness of the pandemic. And we failed really two years or one year back during this when lockdowns were imposed or uh, uh, law, lockdown was implemented. So uh, generally, uh, in contrast to common belief that migrants are a homogeneous group, we first have to understand that migrants are not a common homogeneous group and all the migrants are not same or equal. There is a hierarchy of migrants. So migrants in India can be classified in two groups, uh, permanent migrants, which are more a settled migrants, well-to-do migrants and well-off group, and then the short-term or temporary migrants, temporary labor migrants. So the short-term or temporary and circulatory migrants, uh, they, they keep shuttling between rural and urban areas in search of livelihood and they belong to poor section of rural society who also happen to be mostly the scheduled tribes, scheduled caste and minority communities. So the outbreak of pan pandemic COVID-19 and post lockdown migration crisis in India has really highlighted the poor understanding of government agencies, which still recently has no clue of the real number of migrants and migrant labor staying in different uh, mega cities of the country, cities of the country, or even uh, different uh, capital cities of the countries, country. So during the time of COVID-19 and lockdown period, the temporary and circulatory migrants were badly affected due to their precarious jobs and informal sectors. So now I will talk about migration data in India briefly and give some idea about the, how many migrants were really affected from earlier data and whatever data we have. So data on migration in India is collected through the following sources of government of India. First is the census of India about uh, Professor Mala Rangnathan has uh, discussed briefly. And then we have National Sample Survey Organization. Now it is under uh, CS, I think, uh, Statistical Organization and uh, CSO. So census usually have direct questions on migration to place of birth, place of last residence, 
duration of residence in the place of enumeration, place of residence on a specific date before the census. Indian census also collect information on permanent immigrant, means de facto census. However, it lacks information on the temporary or short term migration. There is no information on out migrants. So latest available data uh, from census is of 2011, uh, which data was released very late. I think I, I remember it was released in 2018 and 19, and we started uh, making some analysis on that. So this data should have been released earlier, then we could have better idea of migrant population. So. Then National Sample Survey Office that comes under Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. It is the other major source of migration statistics, which is collecting migration data from last, uh, uh, I think, uh, 40 to 50 years and collects information on internal as well as international migration, out migrants and remittances, household migration, return migrants and temporary labor migration. Though the NSSO used to collect migration data every seven, eight years, but unfortunately, the latest available migration data is of reference years 2007, 8, 64th round of NSSO. So after that, no detailed data on migration has been collected. We have other sources of government sources of migration. We can say National Family Health Survey also have few questions of uh, place of last residence and place of uh, years lived in the current place of residence and whether you have changed your place, but it cannot be used as a major source because mostly is a truncated data and uh, it has an age limitation. It, we don't have a complete data of uh, complete all the population. Also, the last year, Labor Bureau of India has begun some survey on migrant labor, but no data has been released till date. Hopefully, it may be in pipeline. Other two important, one important source is India Human Development Survey. It is nationally representative survey, which is conducted by University of Maryland, USA, and National Council of Applied Economic Research India. It collected migration data in the last two rounds uh, in 2004-05 and 2011-12. So uh, it has a rich source of migration, but definition of migration, particularly permanent migration, is somehow not uh, according to UN definition. And some uh, critical uh, information is missing, but it gives good information on out migrants, remittances, household migration, return migrants, and seasonal labor migration. So the latest data is still available for 2012. So we can say this is the latest data which we have because census data, recent census has not been conducted and it will come after five, six years. So we have to depend on this. 2012 data and uh, 2007 8 NSSO data and 2011 national sample uh, census data. Uh, we have also uh, some good research institutes like Center for Development Studies Trivandrum, the, sorry, Trivandrum, and International Institute for Population Sciences Mumbai, that is also an institute of uh, Ministry of Health. They keep on conducting some regional levels migrations data through some migration surveys in the states like Kerala, Goa, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. So we have some series of data for this. Now, I'm giving a brief glimpse of number of migrants. So according to census, which gives mostly the permanent migration data. So we had, if in terms of numbers, we had 225 million migrants, 1991, 2001, it was 307 million migrants, internal migrants and 2011 it was 447.1 if you add Kashmir it will be 449.9 and if you talk about intercensal migrants like my, these are the lifetime migrants internal migrants and intercensal migrants are the last 10 years migrants who have uh, changed their place of residence from this census means 2011 to between 2011 and 2001 and 11 so uh, this figure is also not small very big so we have 13.9 million migrants according to 2011 population census and percentage of migrants is increasing really uh, lifetime migrants 2.6 uh, 26.9 to 30.2 and then it has become 37.3 in 2011 and percentage of intercensal migrant has also changed increased from 9.7 in 91 to 9.5 in 2001 and almost 12% in 2011. So this is all about the uh, permanent migrants. And if you talk about the rural urban composition, male, female, 
So females have very high pro proportion of migration, mostly due to 80 or 90% of female migrate uh, to their villages or their districts only, and short duration migration is there, short uh, distance migration is there due to marriage migration. But male migration, majority of male migration is due to employment. Now, uh, we can see the bilateral flow of uh, migrants uh, from this diagram. This can show that uh, so, uh, labor migrants migrated during 2007-8 period. And uh, these are the last 10 years of migrants, uh, zero to nine years of migrants. So major migrant sending states are like in purple color, UP. UP is sending migrants to all over Delhi. Maharashtra, then Gujarat, Bihar is the second important sending state like Delhi is the main receiver for that. It is also people are also going to Punjab, people are also going to Haryana, some are in Gujarat. So this kind of migration flow is there, but this is only for labor migrants and millions of people are migrating to other states. Now coming to the estimates related to temporary labor migrant, I have prepared two columns uh, using national sample survey data of 2007-8, which is the latest one for NSS data or CSO data. So estimated number we can have, it's uh, uh, 13.6 million. And uh, if we talk about the um, states which have a largest number of migrants, we have 2.1 million and UP 1.9 million. If we talk about the estimated number of out of state migrants. So out of state migration was very, very of concern because during COVID-19 lockdowns, these were the mostly affected and they had to travel really hard using whatever means they got out by walking for thousands of hundreds and thousands of kilometers. So uh, in this aspect also Bihar has the, Bihar and UP have lead in this number of migrants. Also, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan have a large number of temporary migrants. So these migrants are of more concern because these are temporary migrants. They don't have a permanent work over in the their destination state. They don't have any particular formal job. They are mostly dependent on informal jobs. They are radio wala, they are, they are our uh, rickshaw wala, they are auto wala. So these kind of migrants are affected uh, very quickly, even there is a five days or six days of lockdown. Like in Delhi, uh, now uh, kind of semi lockdown situation is there. And yesterday I have read newspapers from Gurgaon and NCR region. People are, this kind of migrants are again uh, migrating to their place of origins. Also I have tried from this data to select the hotspots of migration. So which are the sending regions of migration? So one region is very prominent in the southern region of Rajasthan and southeastern region of Gujarat. So these have a lot of concentration of temporary labor migrants. So I hope I have at least two, three minutes because Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Fine. So uh, this region is very important because when return migration took place, I will show again other figure, figure from government. So it is corresponding to my estimated data of migrants. So southern region of Rajasthan and southern region of Gujarat uh, is prominent for sending migrants to these regions like Delhi or uh, even internally to Ahmedabad and Mumbai. Then southern region of Uttar Pradesh Vindyan and southern regions of Madhya Pradesh. This central region is very big hotspot of migrant. Then uh, northern and southern regions of Bihar and the northern region of Jharkhand, that is also known as the Hajariba Plateau. It, it is, a I think, largest host, hotspot in terms of number of migrants, which my even recently I have conducted during this gap of two waves of COVID in Jharkhand. So I found that these these areas are filled up with uh, temporary labor migrants and i have seen the buses daily uh, one bus used to go from J a very small village of jharkhand that is called jori to the ahmedabad 
to Surat, to Delhi, and people have agents there, means bus contractors, and they used to fill these buses with laborers with their consent, and sometimes uh, with their choice uh, by giving some uh, advance money to these places. Even uh, just after I, I began my field survey, uh, just before the second wave, and unfortunately, my team and me was also contracting COVID during Holi. Then I had to stop my survey. So these regions are most important centers of temporary migrants. Odisha and Nagaland are also some uh, bigger centers or spots of migrants. So uh, when we talk about the data released by Ministry of Skill Development and other government sources, uh, well, mostly I've used the newspaper articles. So uh, by end of July, when lockdown was partially removed, uh, means uh, relaxed. So Bihar, 32 districts have shown the return migrants number as 23.6 lakh, Uttar Pradesh, 17.48 lakhs, Rajasthan, 12.9 lakh, Madhya Pradesh, 10.72 lakhs, Odisha, 2.9 lakh, and uh, it is a one source, Jharkhand, 1.1 lakh. And these are typically the temporary migrants because during lockdown or at the time of crunch situation, tough situation, these are forced to leave. They had to leave anyhow. So other source shows that total uh, number of migrants returned in Bihar, 30 lakh, and uh, total skill mapping have been done by government. And total migrants labor return to Jharkhand was 5.5 lakhs. And Uttar Pradesh, highest number of migrant return, 32 lakh. So these figures are very, means, uh, not complete because whatever estimate I have shown earlier, number, so these are older estimates. So the figure may be of twice of that. All migrants are not vulnerable. I am also a migrant, permanent migrant. So I'm not that vulnerable, I have a uh, regular job, but migrants who have informal jobs, who are staying in some city for last two, three years, but they keep on shuttling between rural and urban areas, their destination and origin. So these are the most vulnerable migrants which are affected by the lockdowns. So now coming to one very uh, important survey which we have conducted after second wave, as I told that I had to stop my survey uh, in the last year, March and April, during the session beginning of the second wave. So again, I uh, got a chance to collaborate with some international agencies and university to do a survey in UP. I was the PI for UP and in Bihar, some team members have done, and Delhi, some team members have done survey. So more than 600 migrant households were uh, interviewed and 150 non-migrant household were interviewed and more than 50 qualitative interviews with migrant workers have been conducted. So our brief findings, it is not complete finding because we are still in uh, primary analysis phase. So loss of employment was experienced by majority of them. And we found a significant increase in uh, modern, moderate and severe food insecurity of these groups because our focus was to understand the uh, employment, food insecurity and uh, related aspects of migrants, which really uh, affected their life post uh, uh, second wave. And dietary diversity also worsened post national lockdown in all the states. So uh, just I want to say that uh, there is a paucity of migration data. Latest data we have of 2012 IHDS data, that is also not very, uh, we can say, complete data of migration. Census data gives a very good result, good estimate, but it lacks information on temporary migrants. NSS data, now CSO, it used to give a good estimate of uh, temporary labor migrants and its coverage was also good, but uh, now it is not conducting any survey till, uh, as per my knowledge. So just, uh, we need to have some good data. We need, we need, uh, a good data to do good analysis, to give some good idea about the problems of the migrants or any situation, whether it's a pandemic situation, any disaster situation, or any job loss. So uh, now I am stopping my presentation, ending my presentation, and thanks to everyone for patient listening.
I am open for questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kunal. Thank you. Uh, now I'll request uh, Venkatesh sir to make presentation. Now, just now we listen to the vulnerable group migrant and other uh, equally affected group was the uh, elderly people. So uh, in the next presentation, uh, uh, sir will, will uh, yeah. focus on the elderly group and uh, aging. Thanks uh, to my friend Devinder uh, and my former colleague, Dr. Arjun and colleagues at AMPRI. It's thoughtful of you to have uh, you know, set up a platform for uh, practitioners, professionals to come and share their thoughts on uh, preparedness uh, for the pandemic. I will focus on a very small uh, subset, but an important subset of the population, important group of uh, people who are uh, affected by uh, the pandemic. And my thoughts, again, are not limited just to the pandemic, but as a group, you know, how this group, group of uh, the age at 60 plus uh, will have to be catered to in the future. I understand that uh, there are, uh, next slide, I understand that there are uh, younger people uh, in the, in, in the, in the uh, attending this, uh, you know, panel discussion. Uh, Arjun, can you, next slide, please. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll quickly take you through. This is uh, the first part is not for those who already know about the situation of the elderly in India, but for those uh, who are uh, students and who are uh, who would want to get more information on the status of uh, the elderly in India. And then I'll move on to the issues of uh, you know what data we have, what we do not have, and what is the strength of the data that we have for uh, policy formulation and programmatic responses. And if there aren't you know, relevant data, uh, data are available, but are not on a timely basis, what is it that we should be probably be doing? So you would have heard uh, Professor uh, Mala and uh, our young friend uh, Kesari, uh, who have talked about the issues with migration so on migration and uh, the other data sets uh, that are available that uh, Dr. Professor Mala you know, shared. So let me then start with what is the issue of uh, the aged or the elderly population in this country? Is this a matter of concern? Next slide, please. So as you would see in the coming slide or in this slide, see the problem with uh, India is that we are okay. One of the parameters for knowing as to what is the scenario on the aged is to look at the doubling time. In how many years a country will have doubled the population of the 60 plus? Uh, for this, you will see from this slide that it has taken about 110 years for uh, France uh, to double and about 80 years for uh, Sweden to have doubled. So uh, the, so it uh, means between 1860 and 1980, 110 years almost, 1870 to 1980. So that's the time that you know it has probably taken uh, for uh, France to double its population. But when it comes to India and China, uh, China in 25 years and India in 20 years. So that's the biggest uh, you know challenge that we have. So by about 2030, 2035, we are going to have double the population that we had in 20. Uh, 2011, uh, 20, yeah, 2011. Uh, so that's the seriousness uh, uh, that uh, we need to accord to the agent uh, and uh, therefore think of what policies and programs are critical. And while one thing that, you know, this type of macro data will tell you that, yes, it's the big problem. So what do we do with it? This type of data, we need to have more specific data so that we are able to plan our policies. Next slide, please. So there again, uh, as you would see that India is not one, uh, you know, uh, it's an it's, an, it's a set of uh, states which are at different uh, levels of demographic transition. So you would see uh, with India in the middle, uh, 2011 population, 8.6%, uh, 8 uh, 60 plus. Uh, by 2041, this will become 15.9 national averages. But when you see states like uh, Kerala or Tamil Nadu for that matter even, 
you, know, you will see that it's around 22-23%. So anything about 20% population is called as an aging country or aging state for that, you know, uh, for India, let's say. So, but then again, you have a Bihar, which will hardly have, you know, 11% population, which probably is the national average by the 2021 census. So even in another 20 years, they'll still be, you know, far behind. But uh, then each state has some uh, level of uh, 60 plus population at any point of time, which will naturally be there. So what is the planning uh, that has to take place for the services for these people and what is the databases that are available? Uh, before moving to the database, what are the vulnerabilities for which we need to plan? Next, please. The vulnerabilities are quite high. The vulnerabilities uh, related to economic uh, you know, conditions, uh, to health conditions, to you know, the so social issues of you know, gender and so on. I'll talk about a few. This is not a presentation on the elderly, so I wouldn't want to get into details. But to just to give a flavor to the you know, young participants in, uh, you know, who are hearing, uh, to this, uh, hearing uh, to this panel and to my presentation. So only 30% of the elderly are dependent by or self-dependent economically or 70% are dependent on others, uh, either fully dependent or you know, partially dependent. This is a very alarming situation you know, in this country and needs a big social sector response. And uh, the current response, though in, you know, we can say that there is a response to every uh, you know, issue uh, of the agent, the response measure is quite small. So we need to uh, look at uh, the issues, not for the present, but for the next 20, 30 years, the scenario is not going to majorly change. One other thing for a country like, uh, you know, the European countries or the developed countries, the scenario was different. When they started aging, they also became economically better off. Whereas in India, it's not going to be that scenario. Maybe China to some extent, because their you know, per capita income is quite high. Uh, but for India, uh, it is quite low and it's not going to be, you know, majorly you know, uh, 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 major there will be improvements. There is no two thoughts about it, but not going to be majorly, uh, you know, changing uh, to cover the uh, the entire population. So there will definitely be people below the poverty line for, you know, some for, for some decades. The workforce, uh, which again is a major, you know, con con contributor to the economical, uh, you know, um, uh, to the socioeconomic uh, background of uh, any poor. 90% of the workforce is in the informal sector. So the so savings is very poor and the social protection, you know, that one could have from their, you know, uh, savings is going to be meager in the old age. Then uh, the, even in the formal sectors, uh, which is less than a 10%, I suppose, uh, uh, is uh, the lack of preparation among the agent for uh, the uh, future for post-retirement. That preparedness is quite low. That's why you will see nowadays that there are a lot of advertisements being, you know, put up uh, by the government and uh, less by the government, but other uh, you know, insurance companies asking the young people to start uh, looking at uh, the annuities and, you know, pension, you know, 30 years from now uh, when, they, when they start retiring and so on. So th that type of a thing is very important uh, because the preparation for uh, the retirement is, uh, you know, quite poor. And this gets aggravated, especially when you know people are going to become more uh, nuclear, you know, in their families without much uh, support uh, from others, from the next generation. The interesting thing, some uh, I think in, uh, the earlier two presenters talked about uh, uh, the workforce. I did a small analysis a few, uh, I think last uh, yeah last year, starting last year, around the same time on Manrega. So the, the why I'm saying showing this is that uh, the population of uh, uh, 60 plus is, as I said, about 8.69%, 10%. But whereas when you get to the people who are registered for Mandrega was about 14%, so one and a half times. So what it means is that there is a you know, huge amount of economic need among the elderly and they want to work. And this also comes out with, through you know, studies that uh, my former organization UNFP had also conducted. And this is uh, the uh, data from the government is also consistent. So uh, then uh, similarly, the registration of uh, Manrega for even 80 plus, uh, which is very unfortunate that such old people in this country are working. So just to set, set out a scenario on the economic uh, conditions of the elderly. And uh, then therefore I'll argue as to what is the need for the data for you know, the interventions. Next slide, please. 
So when we look at the issues of uh, you know health uh, and uh, you know gender concerns, uh, we all know that uh, increasing life expectancy brings in uh, you know a lot of morbidities and the disease burden among the 60 plus is uh, definitely going to be high. Uh, but 30% uh, of uh, all the uh, 60 plus to 60 to 80 79 year population have uh, acute morbidities and uh, 80 plus uh, population have almost 40% of them have you know these morbidities. The worst part of this is that uh, women are more afflicted. Uh, morbidities are more, but hospitalization rates because of uh, the poor status of women in our societies, they are not hospitalized, whereas the men, you know, are better treated and they are taken to hospitals and so on. Uh, then 10%, uh, some studies talk of a bit higher averages of uh, higher percentages of uh, people needing the support for active uh, activities of daily living. So this uh, is a, is a uh, you know, area where we need uh, you know, data so that uh, you know, any support, uh, whether in terms of equipment or uh, you know, other support that's needed at the community level, you know, how much of that has to be you know, provided for and what provisions does the policy maker have to you know, provide for. So these are the type of estimates that will, the data that will help in estimating. So therefore, you know, activities of daily living is an issue for the elderly. Then uh, abuse, fact, uh, the um, fact is that the elder abuse is high uh, with women suffering more. So what it means is the men also are suffering, uh, you know, being beaten up, you know, or ill-treated. Beaten up is the last, uh, you know, resort. But there is a lot of negligence uh, on part of the families uh, in not speaking to them you know, they might even provide food, but not speaking to them, not, you know, socializing with them and so on, which is a major, you know, concern, uh, which uh, leads to mental disabilities, uh, 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 mental health, uh, you know, problems, uh, which needs to be, you know, also factored in if uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, services for the agent. Next, please. The... Uh, the, here, if you look at it, uh, if you look at the need for uh, uh, the uh, uh, assistance for uh, daily needs, currently, uh, let us say, you know, 7.6%, and uh, by 2050, 25% of the, pop, you know, 60 plus population are going to need this type of assistance. So how do we prepare ourselves? So, you know, for, uh, uh, for attending to these, uh, you know, needs uh, that are only going to be, you know, increasing. Uh, because we are going to be an aged population and uh, these demands will only rise and it's not going to go, you know, go down. So it's not like fertility. Fertility can go down, but the people on this, uh, uh, in this land uh, are going to stay here and you're going to find more morbidities uh, that needs to be attended. Next. Uh, so therefore, what is the, what is the data that is available, uh, you know, for uh, planning, for, uh, uh, for, for services? As uh, both the speakers earlier talked of, the longitudinal aging study in India, and there are a few others as well, uh, but uh, all micro studies, but this longitudinal aging study is one of the bigger uh, sampled, uh, you know, studies uh, that has been commissioned. And what does it provide? It provides data on the health uh, burden and uh, the risk factors, the healthcare, you know, seeking behaviors and healthcare financing by the individuals, how much is out-of-pocket expenses and so on. Then on social issues uh, related to whether people stay in the families or they are single, you know, what are the social networks, what is, how are they benefiting from social welfare programs and so that, that data is also available, which is a good, you know, wealth of uh, data. On the economic front, uh, income that uh, related uh, data is there. Again, as I said, this is all, you know, uh, sample basis, but still it is a quite a large sample and, you know, one can be... Uh, one can use them, you know, for policy purposes. So wealth, uh, you know, whether they have wealth to fall back upon, if there is a high incidence of, uh, uh, you know, medical, uh, you know, problems that they have, uh, will they go into indebtedness and so on, you know, can be, uh, is available. Then expenditure patterns, then uh, employment, then uh, retirement and, uh, you know, pension um, uh, data is available from this survey. This again is a good thing that has been undertaken for this particular group of 60 plus in this country. And it is good to also benchmark, uh, you know, such uh, with this, which, uh, this uh, data set with uh, other country data set, let, let, let's say of Charles of uh, 
uh, Charles is a study in, uh, from China or, or from other uh, uh, you know country data sets. So how we are doing and so on. So this helps in policy formulation. So what does it mean? It put, let us say in this pandemic. In this pandemic, uh, you know, we are trying to you know, provide for uh, uh, nutritional you know support. So the nutritional support, you will you can do some calculation based on this to say that so much so many people are above sixty, or we do a cutoff at seventy. Seventy plus are more needy, and uh, this is the nutritional status, and uh, this is the economic status, and we you know, triangulate these things and find out that how many people are really in need. So that type of uh, uh, estimation uh, of the populations for providing nutritional support in a pandemic is possible. But the challenge is that only helps you give you a budget, you know, that you can earmark as a finance minister or the finance ministry. But beyond that, at the state level, you know, how do you plan state and most importantly, the sub-district levels? Who are you going to target? So I'll come to that. You know, so the targeting of individuals to seek, uh, uh, to provide for services is the most critical. Uh, and this is where, you know, most of our programs, uh, you know, fail badly. And, uh, you know, there is um, uh, misproportionate uh, distribution of resources where it is not, ed not needed, you provide them where it is needed, you don't have... So that is where more precise planning of services, uh, social services, uh, security services, uh, nutritional security uh, or health services, you know, start faltering when it comes to the, uh, the, the agent. The other aspect of uh, aging services for the aging is that there is no, uh, there is no agency or no department at the state level, which looks at the agent in a comprehensive manner. The health, health looks at you know, certain health services. Beyond that, there isn't anyone. Why? Because the Department of Social Welfare does not have an outreach at the village level. So it doesn't mean that uh, every department will have to have its own uh, you know, human resources. That's what I will argue a bit later, uh, how we can use the currently available resources to collect data. But I'm just giving you the scenario as to how complicated it is to deliver services, you know, to the to the agent uh, for for the uh, for the agent, and uh, most importantly, the lack of data. One can always say that yes, the you know rural development uh, you know does it, but the rural development does not have data. So let let's be clear that you know they do not uh, you know have the precise data and be able to target uh, target uh, in a very objective you know manner. Yeah. Next, please. Okay, uh, for social service provision, I will talk of uh, the you know uh, the health sector you know response. Uh, the health sector response uh, for data, not only on the agent but on for, for you know the entire population. Uh, there is this uh, has been this talk uh, of having uh, electronic medical record or health records for you know quite a long time. Now, even the policy paper, even in the Ministry of Health was in 2014, seven, eight years back, and there have been, you know, attempts both by the government and NGOs, but very, very small scale, but we haven't really, but now that the National Health Authority has reinvigorated in this whole thing, it is good, but how is it helpful? These records are mostly for the health services, you know, being provided. It is a good record of the health history and to record the service that is being you know provided uh, but uh, uh, but the preventive aspects the current status you know those things are not captured in these type of uh, electronic uh, you know medical and health records the, the it has to be you know thought of very differently uh, not very very differently but uh, you know i will argue uh, from uh, literature and experience uh, you know from other countries that there could be an electronic mod, you know, uh, record, but have modules for service provision at the uh, periphery, at the tertiary level, and at the tertiary level, and at the village level, you know, you can have a module to collect data on uh, the different health aspects. I'll come to the other uh, uh, areas uh, uh, which need data, and uh, for that also, this you know, uh, electronic record can be modified. Uh, in today's age of IT, uh, hopefully in a few years, uh, you know, we'll have a good amount of penetration in, uh, I think, a couple of years, probably, 
uh, that we'll have good uh, internet uh, you know connectivity and uh, uploading of data right from the village level itself uh, so th there is this very um, high probability of collecting such data but currently we don't have a system that's my argument here next please okay as i said what is the most important challenge the most important challenge is to find out who needs what service at the village level so i am saying that we need to think of an elder data record system i just gave it a term you know uh, recording system let's say uh, and it should be integrated it should be integrated so that you know we are able to provide day to day services like health services like uh, you know services uh, for pen uh, the pensions that are available for the, the pension schemes that are there so these are services not if not on a day to day basis but at least on a monthly basis uh, so th there has to be a data set which will help in these uh, in the pro in the provision or targeting of uh, the targeting of uh, the services uh, let's say if there is any uh, nutritional scheme so who's going to, who's going to get this you know food in this village we currently do not have much of a you know bpl cards you know all of them are pulled together fine but uh, you know how many exactly are there you know uh, those data is not there and therefore i am arguing that we should we need to have an integrated you know elder data recording system then how do we collect this data so you don't have to have uh, you know surveys uh, surveys of uh, um, you know a small sample are done for research purposes but for programs you need to come up with a solution which is uh, maybe 60% perfect 70% perfect you know 80% perfect depends on the states you know governance uh, you know also uh, but you need to have a uh, system where you can gather data on scale so that's why i am arguing that uh, for those people who have uh, you know gray hair like me uh, would know that uh, uh, there uh, when we started the health program it was all focused on fertility and mortality mortality what mortality of infant mortality and maternal mortality so all our records that are there stop with recording uh, event uh, recording uh, data on individuals on till 49 that's the major focus uh, now there is you know focus bit on national uh, uh, non communicable diseases but not much but but in those times there was not those times even if, i think about 5 7 years back also 10 years back also there was this eligible couple you know survey so now that the country has almost achieved you know fertility uh, um, objectives we need to now reposition ourselves this country will have to think seriously of repositioning uh, you know itself i was reading uh, when they when they asked me to be on this panel i thought that you know it's important to see what's hap what happened in other countries even as uh, late as 2017 18 there was a policy paper a very good interesting paper from uk talking of uh, the effectiveness of uh, national health services and other uh, social services that they are providing and how they need to see this in the next 30 year time span so but whereas in india we are not looking at this type of things so we need to look at how elders are going to be uh, you know serviced Uh, and therefore reposition as of what i was what i'm coming to is that repositioning activities like the eligible couple survey to a family survey uh, which uh, can be updated uh, which can be done every year at the start of the year let's say april may you can devote uh, for every health worker to do it and i can assure you that the data collection will not be a problem because we all know the type of enumerators that are uh, enlisted for the you know big surveys what background they come from except the training uh, the anms uh, need they have better skills uh, the health workers to collect this type of data and it can be undertaken and it can focus on you know physical mental health very very brief it it, it needn't have to you know get into the details because this is not a, a cause of death uh, you know survey or anything just to be done by medical you know professionals this is you know trying to get a sense of uh, you know the physical health the mental health their housing the socialization in terms of whether they are staying alone or with others uh, uh, and uh, most important thing is that this survey being a survey which looks at a bit broader than the health 
interoperability of this database is critical. This country cannot, you know, have each department go and commission studies. This is not the way we should think of uh, community, uh, you know, uh, level, uh, you know, data, especially the uh, the uh, uh, the MIS data, uh, you know, from this the system generated, uh, you know, data. It has to. It has all flaws. We all agree. We know that. But uh, th that's a data set which should be available, and it should be available for different uh, departments to access it <clears throat> for their own planning. So, as I was saying, planning for uh, you know targeting of uh, nutrition supplements, or uh, you know for medical definitely for uh, you know housing that might be given uh, preference for elderly uh, or even skill development, which you would know from uh, the uh, the, the the you know physical uh, condition of the elderly and so on. So for everything, there uh, every department, whatever data they need, for that they should be able to access this data set, and it should be used available, and it should be interoperable. Um, you know everyone can use this database, whichever department, and this is the way to probably go about it. Uh, which then. The topic of today is pandemics. If such a database was there, we wouldn't have been so let down. Uh, currently, we do not have any estimate of the elderly, where they are, you know, where they are, uh, where they are probably we know, but what is the status, the elderly deaths, uh, if it is recorded. Uh, now, Professor Mala was talking of the uh, sensors, SRS, and, and so on. So the data that you get is after five, six years, even Kesho uh, was talking of. So these are all data which comes quite late. So whatever rough and dirty data that you can get, you know, from a system that I am talking of, if only this was in place a few years back, we could have been in a better position. Uh, I think this is the last uh, year. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So this is what I wanted to share, you know, with uh, especially with the young friends, uh, you know, who are part of this presentation. Uh, would love to have, you know, questions. So I am a practitioner. So my thoughts are always in terms of how policies and programs could benefit from data or lack of data and how we need to position ourselves to get better data so that our policies and programs are more targeted and more focused. Thank you. Thanks uh, to the uh, to IMPRA, IMPRI for uh, having me here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are <coughs> running a little late on the schedule. So uh, I will not waste much time and uh, request Urvasi ji uh, to share her thoughts. Thank you. Um, we've already had very detailed presentation, so I'll uh, keep my remarks brief. Um, so firstly, I think this is a very, very important uh, topic, obviously, uh, absolutely critical, uh, especially from the policy making uh, perspective. This is uh, a challenge that we deal with on an everyday basis. Um, now, you know, we're talking of data and uh, pandemic preparedness. I think you know, it's very clear that uh, we can be prepared well for such a situation if our data systems on a regular basis are <laughs> functioning as we would want them to and uh, addressing a lot of the questions that have been raised uh, in the presentation. So I will speak specifically, uh, you know, on health sector data and, and, and um, you know, related uh, data. Now, there's a lot of challenges that we face with this data on an ongoing basis, uh, whether or not we are in a pandemic situation. Um, one is obviously the fragmentation, and that was also spoken about, that even within the health sector data, there's a lot of fragmentation. There's different uh, systems where different data is being collected, and a lot of these necessarily don't talk to each other. Um, and it's also often difficult to trace a single beneficiary or a single individual through these different uh, data systems. So that is, of course, one challenge that we face uh, on an ongoing level. 
to add to that is that you know for those of us who have a public health background as i do um it's not possible to make policies in in public health by purely looking at health sector data it is very important to look at data from a number of other uh, related and linked sectors as well um and that is not very easy or conducive to do right now uh, again because of the multiple different uh, sort of systems that we disparate systems that we have um the identity i spoke about you know through the system how do you track a single individual um and this of course gets even more complicated when we are looking at the multiple levels of data collection and and analysis uh, you know starting right at at the sub district um you know block levels or even below that and then moving its way up uh, through to the state through to the uh, center so that becomes very very challenging uh, and that is something that we need to address um so and then of course you know there is a lot of other issues in terms of the actual collection of the data uh, standardized uh, protocols for doing that um even the different indicators we have do they mean the same thing to everybody uh, do they mean the same thing across states uh, across stakeholders that is often also not the case so so these are a lot of the ongoing challenges that we face uh when we look at data pertaining to the health sector and and therefore we have uh, tried to put in motion certain efforts uh over over the last uh, few years and we are continuing to work on them uh to to a you know streamline some of this data to address some of this fragmentation the existing data sets how can we actually use them better um so we have been working on a, a national data analytics platform which actually seeks to do this that you know whatever existing data we have uh firstly how can we make best use of that because that itself is not necessarily happening um and by saying that how do we make best use of it it obviously means that it's also accessible to uh, stakeholders outside the government uh because they are the ones who can really do a lot of analytics on it who can generate a lot of rich insights so right from academics to to civil society to private sector anyone who uh, really wants to do some meaningful uh, analysis how do we actually get this data to them uh, in a way which is also obviously sensitive and is maintaining the security the safety of the data because you know that is another big challenge in the health sector um where you know consent and the ethical part becomes very very important because this is all very sensitive um data if it is obviously revealed that at an individual level um so that is one part of it but a lot of the other part of the effort that we are doing is how do we actually strengthen our data collection um gathering and uh, analysis mechanisms and in this we have some shorter term uh, steps that we need to take and and a lot of those um insights have also come from today's presentations uh, but we are also building up to a slightly medium to longer term vision and this is something we articulated uh in the action agenda document as well that we had um published is that we do need to uh, strengthen institutional capacity for data um at the state levels at the sub state levels uh, we need to have uh an institution which can be tasked with collecting uh data with analyzing it with putting it out in the public domain uh, on an ongoing basis and and do it in in a sort of independent objective manner because this point was also raised that you know data can often get politicized or everybody can sort of look at it uh from the lens that makes sense to them um and then there can be question marks uh, around the veracity of the data so we do believe that uh, you know and of course this is something that wouldn't happen overnight but we do need to work towards having such institutions um at least to begin with at the regional level but then eventually at least at the state level because you know as we know in india uh, states are more like countries so we really cannot you know just be having this sort of capacity um at at a union level <clears throat> or even a regional level it does need to be much more granular than that 
and then we have certain standardized protocols uh, as per which this data is actually collected uh, and, and analyzed and put out uh, regularly in the public domain. So that is actually the broader uh, vision that we are actually working towards because this is one capacity that we feel uh, needs to be strengthened significantly. We do have a lot of surveys that we do and, and, and that is fine. We can of course continue to find ways and means to improve the periodicity of those surveys, their coverage, um, strengthen them in, in many different ways. Uh, but really, how do we move beyond these surveys as well uh, and look at institutional capacity um, when we are talking of uh, data collection analysis as well as uh, really putting it out on a regular basis. So that is something that um, we are very focused on. Um, and one uh, sort of final point I'll make quickly in the context of pandemics, um, because you know that is the immediate context and um, uh, topic for this discussion, uh, is that we also need to uh, kind of write, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, if if and and when we ever have to face such situations. But I think it applies to other situations as well. Uh, it might not be only a pandemic, but any sort of a crisis situation like this, where uh, there are a lot of different stakeholders who immediately become interested in a particular set of data which is being put out. Uh, you know, with this pandemic uh, has made everybody interested, every citizen, everyone on social media, every single person out there is interested in this health uh, data. Everybody has their views and, and comments and perspectives uh, on the statistics. So. So, and social media, as I said, WhatsApp, all of this, of course, means that uh, these views, these opinions, they also travel very, very quickly. And while some of that is advantageous, uh, there are also challenges and risks of um, some of this data or metrics uh, being misinterpreted or not being looked at in the right way. So that is also something that um, I think is, is, is a learning. Uh, you know, if I look back, uh, last year, because I have been involved in this entire uh, COVID response and uh, part of the work I've been doing is analyzing the data every day. And I've, of course, tried to, uh, you know, put it out on my social media handles and to whatever channels I had, apart from the uh, official channels as well, uh, was because there was a lot of confusion, naturally, so a lot of apprehension um, and very, very small uh, sort of things can go out of control very quickly. So I, I remember when we started uh, last year, uh, we would have these infographics which would go out on social media. I would often see them, uh, you know, which would basically say, okay, such and such state has the highest number of cases. And uh, I used to again and again sort of correct that and say that, well, you know, if that actually means they're testing, uh, then that's probably a good thing. And this is how we need to look at these numbers. So I think that also is a very important piece and I think an important learning um, that the stakeholders, both within the government as well as experts outside, um, whenever there is a situation like that to actually come together and at the outset, set the tone um, for what are the key metrics, how should they be looked at, how should they be interpreted. Um, you know, some of it happened in due course but I think for the future, uh, this could be a learning where this is done much more upfront um, because that would reduce the sort of extent of misinformation uh, or misinterpretation that might also uh, go around. So I think that's a, that's a slightly different point, but I think it's a, uh, it's a very, very important one um, all the same. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a nice way to uh, kind of uh, bring this uh, the, the presentation to an end and with the, uh, what uh, government is doing, what is being uh, done at the policy level and some of uh, the issues raised uh, in different presentation would also uh, got addressed. And uh, I really liked one thing that we cannot just uh, focus on uh, health indicators or health uh, services when we are talking about pandemic, pandemic uh, prepared, preparedness as well as response. Other uh, related uh, factors 
our field also needs to be integrated. And that's what uh, we heard in uh, uh, Vectester's presentation as well as Kunal's presentation. And uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, nice way to bring to a close at the presentation level. Now, uh, we will open for question and answer and discussion. And uh, Arjun, if you can tell me if there are questions uh, from the participants, then we can start with those questions. Right, sir. I will, I will check in Facebook. Okay. <clears throat> So if I can start with uh, my own question in the meantime, when uh, Arjun is looking for questions uh, from the participants. One thing uh, which is coming across uh, that uh, maybe it's a, it's a, uh, uh, not a very fortunate situation that uh, there is pandemic and uh, because of pandemic, we, we have come to know that there are two, three things which came up in the, in the presentation. That one is that we don't have adequate data. We don't have uh, uh, sufficient data. The second thing is that data, which, which whatever data we have is not collected or updated very regularly. Third, there are serious quality issues as Professor Ramanathan pointed out in SRS and CRS data. Uh, uh, quality issues are there, completeness uh, uh, issues are there. And also there are a lot of uh, uh, differentials across states. In that situation, uh, and we are also seeing uh, the, the kind of I should not be saying uh, turf fight, but who will do which survey? Like labor survey, it will be labor bureau, it will be Niti Aayog, Niti Aayog, or it will be NSSO. Who will do that survey? Ministry of Labor will do, Labor Bureau will do, Niti Aayog also took uh, at one point of time that we will uh, have uh, uh, a survey to find out the exact number of labor, especially in relation, it came, the, it came in the, uh, context of uh, uh, kind of uh, reduction in uh, women workforce participation. So there are several issues related to data. Now this like census is also affected. We, we will not have uh, census data and because census data will not have the SRS data, the panel uh, will be affected. As Kunal also pointed out, on some issues, we, we don't bother to, to come up with, with data. Like for example, 2011 census, the projections for the next 20 years, that team was not set up until 2020. On migration data, the panels were not released up to 2018. Uh, uh, correct me uh, if I'm wrong, Kunal. So- Yeah, you are right. It's, Dr. Singh, the data say, was released not Kunal in 2019. 2019. It was not even 18. It was released in sometime yeah, in August. Yeah, yeah, small tables they have released one or two Excel files by two, 18, and two, then in 19 they have released major okay, majority okay, of them. Yes, yes, you are right. Only no. 2019. Yeah, you are right, ma'am. Yeah. So, so that that's like, are we serious about data? So one, as I was saying that pandemic has opened our eyes that there is a serious need of data. We need to have data, different kinds of data at the population level, as well as services, health services, and other services level. We need to have that kind of data. So from the uh, panelist, I want to ask, is this only the realization or do we, may, are there concrete uh, steps uh, which are being taken uh, by the government to to strengthen uh, the uh, not only the quality are uh, but also uh, availability and regularity of that data. Yes, and sir, also there are not more, uh, much questions on Facebook and comments only. Uh, 
but let me ask one question. We also have now real time data as there is also, you know, periodicity and lag in the data. For uh, unorganized worker, we have eShram. Uh, we have also the, the uh, insurance data also, uh, many from the health side also. How do we see going forward uh, the use of this real-time data? Because administratively, this data is only being used. For example, we are giving PM Kisan to all the farmers. So we have more data, real-time data now. So how to go ahead with that also? Uh, what are the views of the panelists? So yes, Nala, ma'am, over to you. Yeah, the, the issue with most of these large scale databases is the matching denominators. See, when we need to do relative tracking individuals for monitoring their health, you know, this kind of data is okay. But when you need to look at investment, for instance, how much more money do we need to put in for vaccination in which state? A question of this kind calls for also the rates. And for that, we need valid denominators. In 2022, we cannot be talking about 2019 data. And that is, you know, we need, we have a system. You know, the RGI's office used, census office used to have, you know, this issue of getting our projections would not have been a problem if the Statistical Bureau of the Census had been retained and it continued to function. It was a regular exercise that we did making projections and validating it in the intercensal period. I'll give you a small problem that we are going to face in all our future computations with population. Small issue. Every time 2011, 2021, 2031, 41, 51, 61, 2001, 2011. Every 10 years, we had an estimate. We divided the rates by 10 and got intercensor. Now, for any accurate estimates in future, when we do the census of two, in 2022, we will need to retrospectively have the same figures for 2021 because a lot of our computation is incumbent upon that. Therefore, you know, strengthening the statistical capacities and proactively, you know, planning for this is an extremely important thing to do in the now if we have to learn. And that is a lesson, you know, we can't let systems go off thinking that, you know, on and ongoing, every time we think that our CRS is improving, we don't need SRS. Our SRS is improving, we don't need CRS. So we didn't bother about anything. It's time that, you know, we bothered about everything. Not in silos, you know, SRS, SRS, CRS, CRS. No, because each one, census feeds into SRS. SRS feeds into CRS. Everything is interrelated. If we don't realize that now, you know, when are we going? And it's not that these efforts are not ongoing. We need to, you know, do it more urgently. It is something which, you know, moves at a very phenomenal pace with 1.25 billion people. Things move slowly. We need to come out of that inertia now because that is the lesson the pandemic taught us. That becomes an issue. Now we have to do it with some degree of urgency. It is not that we are lacking in capacity. It is not that we are lacking in the will. We need to bring everything together. That's my take home message. Thank you, Maladi. Yeah, uh, quick uh, response. I think uh, uh, Madam Urvashi, you know, talked about. Madam Urushi talked about the responses from the government. There, uh, to me, you know, having worked on the other side of the government for more than three and a half, de uh, three and a half decades, I can see the level of appreciation today in the government for on lack of data. You can also see, you know, certain political statements that we don't have data, we need to do that. But having said that, there has to be immediate response in terms of revising our, you know, our, uh, you know, statistical. Uh, you know, system, not the, you know, data gathering system, but the whole structural, you know, uh, 
uh, let's say the Ministry of uh, you know MOSPI. Now, how is it currently structured? Whether it has teams to look at integrated in an integrated manner different data sets for different groups. That type of a I think thinking is uh, you know important. I also understand from my colleagues in the statistical services, uh, many of them have retired, uh, that uh, the statistical commission had a lot of very very good uh, uh, you know suggestions. But unfortunately, not much of them have you know been uh, made into a reality. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Mala's uh, you know lament or uh, you know great concern, I would say, on uh, the uh, the you know, non-functional uh, you know parts of the census is is something very critical, and uh, that is something that we cannot you know uh, we cannot uh, be a developing country or a developed country in another five years or whatever. Uh, targets we want to set without data. That is something that has to be seriously taken, you know, through. And I hope you know the current political dispensation also puts in efforts beyond uh, you know the thought processes that are there to see that you know these things improve. And in institutions like Niti, you know, should probably uh, you know lay out a, a very strong uh, uh, you know map on how we are going to position ourselves with a, with almost like a six monthly. Or you know, annual targets as to what is it that we are going to achieve in terms of repositioning, you know, our organizations that are working on data over the years, and also the role of the statistical institutions. You know, to me, I am not, a, I said I am a practitioner, but I'm not a practitioner from that point of view, but on the side of practice, you know, I've been engaged. And I don't see, you know, the, you know, the link between, you know, the academic and, uh, you know, the policy makers that strongly. That also needs to be, you know, looked at and promoted. Not that you know they might not want to be part of it, but there has to be, you know, from this side also the practitioner side also to engage. Let me stop here. I think it's quite a, you know, long, you know, debate that we have had. Thank you. Urvasi ji, uh, you want to add? Uh, Kunal, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I'm also in support of integration of data. Like if you are collecting some data for some purpose, so different organizations should not collect differently. So uh, there should be a uh, common objective of government data sources. If we are collecting like in NFHS, most of the things have been covered now. DLHS has different objectives, but uh, AHS and other. So there is some sort of integration is going on. So similarly in socioeconomic data, we have NSS, CSO, they are doing their own job. So migration also needs some special focus, particularly even uh, if NFHS is uh, collecting some data on migration, so <clears throat> uh, it should uh, give some more uh, emphasis on some uh, basic questions of migration. If NSS is not doing that survey, then census could have uh, improved something like uh, temporary migration or uh, this kind of uh, information should be collected in census also. So that uh, different agencies should not be involved in means same exercise. Otherwise, integration or synchronization of data is, uh, I think, uh, need of the time. Thank you. There is uh, what Arjun was hinting at that there is one is this large large data coming from census or NSSO or from uh, different survey. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 but there is big data also, uh, uh, real time data, which he said. Uh, uh, which could be with the ministries, with different programs, and which Niti Aayog is keeping a close tab also uh, because of uh, monitoring of the sustainable development goal uh, on different indicators. Uh, so how we can use that real-time data or the programmatic data uh, uh, which ministries are collecting with uh, Niti Aayog also uh, keeping a tab on that how that could be uh, uh, marshaled yeah. uh, in a situation like this, when we may not have a very regular data, like data is very old, but there are other sources of data, how we can use that. The, uh, Madam Urvashi was opening her mic, uh, you know, okay. uh, Devinder uh, for her yeah. comments probably. Uh, I'll just say one thing, you know, uh, countries like South Korea are not doing, sir, uh, not doing census the way we are doing. Uh, Devinder, you would recollect when we had this, you know, uh, team from South Korea, they shared with us that administrative records are becoming the basis 
in developed in developed countries so i think we need to have a road map as to how are we going to do the 2031 census or maybe 2031 census let's say the 2041 census at least by then we should have strong administrative records so that's the way forward uh, maybe you know uh, devender you might request madam urvashi i think she was ji urvashi ji yeah yeah no i was just uh, adding like a couple of very quick points so um, no i absolutely agree i think all all points are uh, very very well valid and uh, very well taken in fact i think you know you mentioned sdgs and and that is actually one of the uh, given that niti is sort of tasked with uh, the overall uh, sort of implementation of that one of the things we are doing is trying to use that as um uh, a channel to then actually engage with states because what has happened is um with the whole change and transition from planning commission to niti aayog uh, a lot of the state planning departments are also looking for and in need of uh, a sort of new and 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 reenergized role um and and one of the things that we are trying to bring in there is the data aspect because you know like i mentioned and others have also emphasized that um this is not something we can think of as just you know piecemeal approach or a few surveys here and there uh, this needs a, a strong institutional capacity on an ongoing basis uh, and so that we are looking at that you know can we make some inroads um through the state uh, planning departments and you know get into the states using this i mean while we are talking of sdgs uh, but ultimately data is what underpins all of that so that is actually one of the uh channels that we are trying to uh use you know even even as i speak and you know as we are engaging with a lot of state uh, departments on that um so i think that is something that uh, i think we should uh, take forward in a very very sort of concerted um way and and i think just you know this is something i wanted to mention in the beginning but i think it, it then came up subsequently that it is actually um very complex in terms of uh you know so like you mentioned real time data administrative data and then of course we have more longer you know sort of longer term data that comes out um but also i think especially in a sector like health uh, where there is so much of data which actually lies outside the government uh tapping into that you know because a lot of people are actually going for health services outside the 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 government system and not all of it would be in a large you know corporatized hospital i mean people might be going to a two bedded three bedded smaller establishment so there's data residing in all of those um and i think that's also a big piece of the challenge for us is is how to actually aggregate this data get it together from all the different types of uh stakeholders and service providers that actually um exist and i think in health we see a lot of diversity and and you know it would be true in other sectors also uh so how do we actually do that it's it's again it's not a new question uh but it's a very very challenging one for us uh because otherwise a lot of the data we might be seeing might only be actually be a very small piece of it um whereas a lot of the other data would be actually outside the government system so i think that is just to add on to that that i think that's another very important uh, and challenging element that uh, you know we're trying to look at yeah that's that's all from me thank you urvashi ji if i may quickly ask you you mentioned something on national data L- analytics platform yes can you elucidate a little bit for the uh, information of our participants what right. it is and right yeah yeah so this is uh, something that you know it's been in the works uh, the the last uh, few years but now it has sort of picked up a lot more momentum uh, in recently and and we are actually hoping that uh, it should be launched also quite uh, soon for for the public as well so i think here the main idea is that uh, we have picked up certain sectors you know health is there various other sectors are there um, where we are actually trying to look at whatever is currently existing um and and whatever you know so as i said we have so many different types of metrics indicators which are currently uh, existing but they are not necessarily being all pieced together um and and analyzed in a way that you know we can derive uh, fully meaningful information from them so that is i would say the overarching sort of goal of this exercise uh, so this by itself uh, is not expected to address all our issues but this is more to look at 
existing data, whatever we have available, um, actually uh, cleaning that up, putting that out in a meaningful way um, for anybody to look at. So this is data which will be in the public domain. Uh, this is not just for government, but this is meant to be for everybody outside the government system as well to be able to say that in a particular sector, uh, if I want to look at you know, a, a, a bunch of indicators, how are those uh, moving and what has been the trajectory and what are the insights we can actually get from the currently available data systems. So that is sort of the first step that we are taking with this uh, national data analytics platform. So that's why I said the focus here is much more on making data accessible and focusing on the analytics part. Uh, but it is also going to then obviously logically move on to looking at the actual you know, type of data being collected and the quality and, and you know, so on and so forth. So that is really the sort of um, initiative in a, in a nutshell. Thank you. And that, that, that answer are, uh, Arjun and my question both, like how the large data as well as the big data are the real time data, are the administrative data, which ventures are also mentioned, how that could be brought together. I, I, and, uh, uh, I hope that this uh, analytics uh, platform that that will be a good uh, good place to, uh, to to bring all data set together, clean them, and how best they can be used to assess the progress on different indicators, and uh, not only in the context of such a development goal, but overall development goal of the country. Uh, I think let let let's see how it progresses. Uh, if there are no other questions are uh, from uh, like panel discussion among themselves, if they want to ask anything uh, uh, from Arjun, then uh, if we Sorry, can... If any panelists want to add anything or we can go to a way forward round also. Uh, way forward, this was the way forward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe sir, you can summarize followed by your vote of thanks. Okay, so uh, as I was pointing out that uh, a few things came up, uh, uh, importance of uh, Arjun, you want to do? Sorry. No, sir, please, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, but I think you, you shared the page, that's why I thought. So a uh, few things came up. Uh, uh, data, uh, importance of data has been recognized by all the panelists and in uh, Areas more, more just more than health, but uh, the uh, morbidity data, mortality data, the data sources which, uh, which are being provided that migration like uh, uh, has been uh, exclusively we have discussed uh, as well as aging. So there is an urgent need of uh, regular, high quality, and complete data uh, that has been recognized, and uh, whether it's uh, Long-standing uh, concerns are uh, 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 demand of the of the data users, or uh, it uh, came out more uh, uh, with, with a uh, uh, heightened focus during the pandemic. But this demand has come up, come back on the uh, 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 platform that we need to have good data. Then uh, second thing that there are different data sources, how we best can use the, while we keep on uh, trying to strengthen the data sources and improve the quality uh, of, of the data, there are other data sources, uh, how we can harness or mine the data from uh, those sources like uh, administrative records or uh, 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 services and programs data, how, how that can be brought together. Like for example, migration, if the survey is not taking place, so what are the alternative uh, uh, sources of data apart from the small studies which are being conducted? Could the ESHRAM data, could that become a source of, uh, of, of data on, on migration? So we need to think of uh, uh, imaginative uh, alternative ways, how, how we can have data uh, till the time that we have regular surveys or we, we have better quality uh, data from the uh, nationally representative samples or from uh, census. That, that was another point. 
when when we were thinking of this uh, uh, this topic, the population data and uh, pandemic preparedness, what we were also thinking that it is not only uh, 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 when the pandemic is happening or after the pandemic. Uh, how we can use the population data. But there are three stages of the pandemic. And in each stage, how we can use the population data. Like uh, the first is how to prepare or uh, uh, predict the pandemic. What kind of data, population data can be used at that? And uh, uh, Professor Ramanathan uh, stressed on the importance of uh, denominators are the estimates at the local level of the, of the data. If we have good projections or estimates and forecasting of the population based on census, we know what kind of population, vulnerable population living in which areas. Could that be used to predict the behavior of, uh, of the, uh, not only predict the behavior, but also how it's going to impact different population groups? what kind of uh, uh, mother and child uh, requirements are there in a particular society? What, how, what kind of aging population is there? As uh, uh, Mr. Venkesh Srinivasan was saying, that it, it's not going to be seen in, in different states. Like Kerala is pretty different than, uh, than Bihar. So how we can use this kind of data to plan for the for the uh, epidemic like for example when when the first wave when the pandemic started we did not include the family planning services as part of essential services did we not know that this is a kind of emergency services we cannot stop the uh, birth or uh, um, services for the uh, elderly people that they, they will require the uh, uh, not only medical attention but also services related to which are uh, uh, terminal diseases so but those were stopped only focus was on the uh, containing the pandemic this kind of use of population data can be helpful in, in preparing for these, these services. Similarly, when lockdown happened, we did not anticipate what could be the magnitude of migration problem because these data are not talked of. These, these issues are not in public. We are not collecting the data. We, those are, if we don't have data, then we may not have high visibility of also of the issues of the, of the migrant population. So, to prepare how population data can be used as a, as a predictive force. Then planning the resource, uh, sorry, planning the response, uh, what kind of res uh, resources will be required for health, for economic needs, for other, other services. Similarly, when we are in the recovery mode, what kind of pop population uh, uh, needs are there, what kind of population is vulnerable, how the different population groups have been impacted. The population data, population data can be used to, to uh, uh, address those issues in the recovery or rehabilitation or mitigation stage also. Then in the end, what, what, what I would like to add, that it's not availability of data only, which is important, but use of data, data also. And Mr. Venkatesh Srinivasan also pointed out that the NDME, uh, uh, National Disaster Management Authority, do they have the capacity to, to use the population data in their forecasting, in their response plans, as well as in their rehabilitation plan? Uh, do we have enough population scientists who can be assigned to uh, planning board in different states are the uh, ND, uh, NDMA uh, to, to work out on these. So use of data is also equally important, not only availability of data as Dr. Urubasi was also saying that understanding the data or making sense of the data is also very important how we project the data. 
the number of cases high in one state that could easily skew the discourse in social media that cases are high there, but it could be because of the better test, testing. So how we use the data, how we project that data, then projection estimation based on the population census, we need to have the denominated data so that we can plan accordingly for the needs of different population groups, whether it's the school going children, whether it's the adolescent young people, or it's the, for the family planning or for migrant or for the elderly population, how we can have a desegregated data for different population group, group to plan accordingly. Then very important, it's also the visualization of data. Having the data, making projections, and then visualize the data so that it is available at the local level for people to see this, these are the different target population groups in these areas when we start making an emergency plan or pandemic uh, preparedness, we need to account for these different population groups. I think that that is the takeaway from this session uh, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, uh, again, very informed decision uh, discussion took place and uh, I'm really thankful to all the expert and panelists. Uh, we could have a good academician's perspective, a practitioner uh, perspective, as well as from the media and the government perspective also. And uh, uh, oh, we, we hope to continue these discussions later on also, uh, taking different themes. What we are thinking, Arjun and I are thinking that next we may have on uh, uh, on demographic dividend how uh, decreasing for fertility uh, it is going to affect the demographic dividend and different uh, 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 employment scenario or education scenario or skill building scenario how that is kind of uh, taking place so that whether we are moving in the right direction so next could be on demographic dividend in the context of decreasing fertility. And also, uh, we would like to have another session uh, on health and uh, budget, which is close to heart of Arjun. He has told me two, three times that we need to have something, how we are going, especially in the context of what different communities and different population groups have faced and uh, the pandemic situation is still going on. So how health, uh, how budget is going to be responsive to those needs. So, we will be in touch with, and I'm really thankful because, and uh, 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 to all the panelists, this was the first session. So it, it is going to be a kind of a very close to our heart that we started with the four experts. Uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, hand over to Arjun. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And to all the panelists, to, to formally give a vote of thanks, now I invite Anshula. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone, uh, and all our panelists and our moderator for this very uh, enriching and uh, thought-provoking deliberation, which has been a wonderful way to kick off this series, Population and Development. So as we come to the end of the session, I, Anshula Mehta, Senior Assistant Director at IMPRI, would like to thank all of you on behalf of the IMPRI Center for Human Dignity and Development for joining us today for this web policy talk on population data and pandemic preparedness. We would like to thank uh, Mr. Devinder Singh for moderating and really stirring steer today's discussion. Thank you, sir. We are grateful to all our panelists, Dr. Venkati Srinivasan, Professor Mala Ramanathan, Ms. Urvashi Prasad and Dr. Kunal Kishri for taking out their time to join us today and for sharing their valuable insights and perspectives in this deliberation. Thank you. And of course, thank you to all our participants who joined us here on Zoom, as well as on Facebook Live, or would be watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our podcast. We are grateful and we hope that you continue to tune in to future episodes of Population and Development, as well as our other web policy talks. And with that, I wish you all a, a good night. Thank you.